Okay, we should begin maybe. Attention please. First of all, I would like to thank you all for coming here. It's so nice to see so many people coming here. May I uh, ask you how many of you are doing their PhD studies? And the rest of you are either medical students or master students of some sort? Very good, very good. How many people of you know anything about immunology? Like what a T cell is? Okay, we have a little majority. So uh, I would like also to thank the Karolinska Institute to ask me that asked me to provide you with a so-called inspiration teaching. Okay. So before we go into the science, uh, maybe I should tell you a little bit about what I believe into inspiration. Uh, inspiration can be. Uh, I, I decided very early to. Uh, try to, to focus my research and my way of thinking and to choose very carefully who I want to work with based on to inspiration. That means uh, curiosity-driven research. And uh, if my very subjective opinion about a lot of the research that is performed at KI is that very often you need to have a very strong focus on to producing a marker or uh, some kind of compound that will inhibit or activate or something like that, which is very, very good. My, my way, we do that too, but my way of thinking is that I want to ask myself, uh, how does it work? And then part of the, the way of thinking is to sometimes dare to perform some experiments that are not necessarily financially covered by different kind of organisms. Do you follow me? And then some, most of these experiments fail. But sometimes when you ask some questions, and this is what I would try to exemplify today, uh, they can become quite nice stories that can be of fundamental understanding. Inspiration can be at several levels, so for most of you, when you're going to choose your supervisors, he or she, uh, try to look for someone that is positive. Uh, try to find someone that will inspire you in the sense that this will be not be someone that just will stipulate for you exactly which project you should do, but also explain to you why this is exactly important. And this person will probably not be able to provide you with a time frame for that. There are no guarantees. And today, the this, this system that we're within the Karolinska Institute is that PhD studies should be within the frame of four years. When I did my PhD studies, we did not have such limitations. Thus, you have an advantage. That means that you are not guaranteed, but nearly guaranteed an exam when you perform your PhD studies. But also you have a restriction in the fact that you need to produce a certain amount of work that need to be finished quickly, within four years. Positivity is something that is, uh, in my opinion, also um, underestimated. There is uh, kindness is uh, one of the features that I would like to suggest to you to look very much for. Financial means. Uh, for doability, but also that you have colleagues around you and in the group that you are coming to that will be also positive and helpful. My inspiration is uh, based on to learning to know people and also together with them. I'm not false positive, this is really something that is very important for me and has become more and more important uh, the longer I aged. To find out people that inspire you by having a positive way of thinking to address problems, and to be pragmatic also, to realize that we are not going, going nowhere with this, so let's stop and do something else. Everybody with me? Inspiration can come also from elsewhere than the academic world. It can be at the private level. Inspiration can have be from happiness of being into a couple, that you can communicate, because that's what you do. I mean, when you are with a partner, you don't talk only about sex or uh, romance or movies, you sometimes talk about what you work about. If you really like what you work about, then usually you can communicate that and make it agreeable. And then this person could be positively coming back to you and saying to you, well, I don't agree with you, and I had the experience of that. I dated a lady who was a CEO, and she told me that basically what you're doing is not going towards the community. You are not communicating this enough. And when she left me, uh, my sadness, Help me to focus also. That's also inspirational, because when you get sad, you guys are so young, maybe you did not encounter sadness yet, but we get sad, one way of moving away from that is to try to focus on work, 
okay? That's way of like not thinking. And that can be inspirational. At the end of this, I will try to go quite rapidly. Of course, I'm a professor of Karolinska, and I have too many slides, but I will try to be pedagogic. <coughs> my name is Adnan Ashur. My uh, mother is from former Yugoslavia. My father is Moroccan, or was Moroccan before he passed away. And I'm uh, born in Morocco, and I'm raised partially in France. So I have multicultural. So I'm a typical product of a foreigner that made it within Karolinska Institute. In my opinion, if you look around all the array of all the professors that we have, we talk a lot about gender issues, and all too little, in my opinion, about uh, introduction of other elements that are from foreign countries within our system. So I'm a so-called professor in molecular immunology, and I work at a place called Science for Life Laboratory. And the inspiration can be also like this, that I have not been asked by Karolinska to move to to, to SciLife Lab. I, got, uh, I, I went there before the Karolinska came in, and I was, I'm still accepted there by the Karolinska Institute. I'm very happy to be here. This is like a place where you have four different universities that is localized just at the other end of the campus. And officially and very happily, I'm part of the Department of Medicine in Solna. And I decided to move to the Department of Medicine in Solna since I found that in my former department, the positivity was not there as much as I wanted it to. So I base my relation and my work on trust. And if I feel that the trust is going down, I'm looking elsewhere for somewhere where I can feel harmonious. And that is something I'm not trying to patronize you with. This. I'm talking just about myself. I'm looking for harmony. Because when I'm harmonious, I work better. I think better and I sleep better. Okay? And uh, in the title of this, so basically what I will show you, I will show you some results that have been published for two weeks ago and some results that will be submitted very well. If you are interested into these things, I will uh, provide you with some references that you can easily look at and l read by yourself. Okay? Any question by now? So first of all, this is a classical cell, a normal cell. And cells are uh, usually considered by me when I was a PhD student when I chose to go to Claire Chere, who is uh, a professor also in molecular immunology at MTC and now Biomedicum, I was thinking that this was like a sea onto which there was a little Vasco de Gama sailing here. This is not the truth. A cell is uh, an amazing medina full of proteins that are contiguous to each other, continuously interacting with each other. There are motorways there. There are a lot of different processes that are depending on each other and that are ultimately helping the cell to survive and to function. One of the very, very important functions within any kind of antigen-presenting cell, that means nearly all cells into your bodies, is that for any kind of protein, these proteins will be cut into pieces and small peptides. And these peptides will be presented by molecules called major histocompatibility class one molecules. These molecules can be non-classical or classical MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. Today, I will talk about some curiosity-driven research that has led us to some discovery here about how do the peptides that bind to a specific MHC allele actually bind, and what does it mean? And secondly is we are very much interested in these kind of cells that are CD8 T cells. When it stands cytotoxic T cell, it means that it has become activated. It carries a T cell receptor that interacts very, very carefully with the combination of the peptide and the MHC class 1. Okay? It's the package of the peptide and the MHC. So imagine like a peptide, like a sausage into a hot dog. And depending if this cell is healthy, there will be a continuous antigen processing and presentation of peptides from proteins that are belonging to the cell, and that they will be presented there, reflecting on the surface of these cells, I'm healthy. If now a virus comes in, or if there is a cancer-like modification or cancer modification, and everything works fine, then the proteins from the virus, for example, will be produced, ubiquitinated, cut into pieces, and then presented there, signaling on the cell surface that this cell is infected. Similarly, in some cancers, there will be maybe 
overexpression of specific peptides that are called tumor associated. And that can then be used in order to target these tumor cells by inducing CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, or NK cell recognition of these cancer targets. Still, very little is known about what's happening here. More recently, during the last five months, there has been some fundamental advances into that, and we have been playing a minor role into this. Any questions? No. Okay, so before we go into the blah blah, this is a typical MHC class one with the beta 2 microglobulin. The cell membrane is here. Everybody with me? And then you have this peptide here, which usually for an MHC class one is about nine mer. That means nine amino acids. There are some rules for how it binds. Most of the peptides that bind to a specific MHC allele will make, here we look at this from the side, they will make use of anchor positions. That means residues that are diving deep in the cleft of the MHC. These are called anchor positions. And this is what the T cell receptor or the NK cell receptor looks at, is the combination in slimy green here of the MHC heavy chain residues together with the peptide that is so it's the combination of what you have in green and this peptide that the T cell receptor is specific to. And this is what crystallography is good at. Is what for me, crystallography, what I did, again, if I go back and a little bit uh, self-ego tripped here, um, when I decided to make my PhD studies, I was inspired by class. I was, I'm a mathematician educated from KTH. I'm probably one of the worst products that KTH ever produced. But I had a quick interview at that time with class five minutes, and boom, I was selected, and he took a chance on me. That's also, luck is very much part of the game. But very rapidly, strategically and maybe pragmatically, I was thinking there are so many immunologists and there are so many structural biologists, let's combine the two of them and try to find my niche, which makes me maybe a little bit more unique. Think about that. When you solve structures, and this is uh, a structural model of a T cell receptor that binds to the combination of the peptide with the MHC class one molecule, then there is what I would like you to, attra uh, attract to attract your attention to is that if we really simplify this T cell receptor at the top here, yeah, I don't know if you can discern them, there are six loops. And these loops are like tentacles. They're called complementarity, determining, determining regions, one, two, three, and one, two, three, one. So there are six loops that bind onto the combination of the peptide and the heavy chain. This binding is not like an enzyme binding to something very strongly with high affinity and cutting it and releasing the product. Here, there is a very important word. It is subtle. It's like a caress. And this subtle interaction will either result in complete recognition, partial recognition, or no recognition, and can lead either to death or survival. Thus, this interaction, beside the antibodies, the NK cells, and all the other cells of the immune system, is essential for us in order to try to fight infections and especially treat cancer patients. Okay. From now on, and very often, this is the peptide, and now we show the peptide only from its N-terminal to its C-terminal, like this. You don't need to know exactly the residues. What I would like you to know about is as much as possible about as little as possible. <laughs> if we remember this. And we will have a schematic. The T cell receptor will always be there, and the MHC will be there. But for the pedagogic reasons, I will show that peptide like this. Everybody with me? Good. So let's go into the antigen processing cell. You have a protein. And usually, this protein will be ubiquitinated, marked with ubiquitin. And then it will be elongated. That means it will t lose its 3 default, and it will be going through this channel, which is called the proteasome and or the immunoproteasome. It's like a machinery that chops down this elongated protein in small peptide pieces. And these peptides will be actively transported by a molecule called TAP into the endoplasmic reticulum, where the heavy chain has been constructed and waiting for the peptide. The selection of the peptide, of which peptide binds to which MHC, is coordinated by a large ensemble of different proteins that commonly are called the protein loading complex, the PLC. It is quite clear about what some of them do, and still remain unclear anyway to me 
what RP57 really do in all details and Cal reticuli in all details. But now we're going to talk about tapasin, which both binds to the tap in order for the peptide to close the, the distance there, but also binds to the MHC that is peptide empty and try to find out which of the peptides that make it in there will actually be selected to move in and bind to the MHC one. Why is that important? Because knowing that, we can maybe manipulate this to enhance in certain conditions some kind of specific peptide presentation that will enhance immune recognition. When the peptide, the adequate peptide is born, the product will go into a vesicle through the Golgi, where it will go through some post-translational modifications and be presented on the cell and hopefully be recognized by an activated CD8 T cell that then will kill the target or not, because maybe the binding is not occurring because it's a self-peptide. Okay? Please interrupt me if anything is not... So I told you that uh, most of the peptides that bind to MHC class 1 are nightmares. 10 mers, 8 mers, 12 mers. But in the literature, so uh, interactions with other colleagues, I seldomly go to meetings. Uh, I prefer to be in the lab and then be with my kids. But sometimes I go to meetings and I talk to people. And in the late 90s and later on by the group of Sebastian Springer in Bremen, it has been shown that you can take actually a D-peptide, only two amino acids, and if you add it exogenously to cells, then the amount of peptides that will be presented is enhanced. And then he came to me and to our, my colleagues and asked us, can you, would you be willing to try to see if you can make this D-peptide that does not correspond to the norm bind to the cleft of an MHC? And I went to my former PhD student, Ida Hafstrand, and my colleague, Tatiana Sandalova, and told them, Shall we dare do that? Well, maybe it's difficult. And then we did it. And we solved the structure, so we were able both to solve the structure of a nearly peptide empty MHC class 1. What you have in blue is positively charged, what you have in red is negatively charged, and here you see this D-peptide, and the rest of the cleft is basically empty. There's a detail about how it binds. This is a completely new thing that is killing the dogma. You can have, because the dogma says that MHC cannot come up to the surface empty. But here we demonstrate that you can have nearly nothing, and the MHC is there well folded. The second news is that when you compare in some kind of sign color here a classical MHC class 1 with a classical 9 peptide with the same structure that we had, you can see that the cleft is as open as when it is occupied by a full-length peptide. And it sounds a little bit nerdy, but this is fundamental because it means that there is something that is called peptide receptive state, that the MHCs are not, as it has been speculated, closed, that these two helices are closing to each other and will open only when the peptide comes in. That means that this is open and ready to receive the peptide. But how does it work? So that's where the curiosity also comes in. Curiosity is like, okay, does, can we actually solve the structure of an MHC with two two a dimer? Yes, we can. And then the second thing is that, uh, actually, I had in that case, most of the time it's my colleagues that have the ideas, I ask my student, okay, what's the identity of this D-peptide? It's a glycine leucine. And then I ask her, can you look in the sequences or structures of all these proteins that belong to the PLC, the peptide loading complex, if there is a glycine leucine somewhere. And she could not find it, Ida could not find it first, because it was not visible in the structure, because the loop onto which it is was too mobile, so it was not solved in the crystal structure. And then we went to the sequence and we found that actually in tapasine, at the tip of a loop that we modeled here, there is a glycine leucine. So we made a model, a hypothetical model, into which we tried to see if this loop could reach in here and could allow this leucine to bind into an F pocket, the deep into that. And theoretically, it works. So based on that, we first, before we continue with crystal structures, we make use of a cell where we remove the tapasine completely, okay? And then we to put back either an empty vector or the full-length tapasine, and then we modified this 
glycine leucine by either removing single residues for leucine to alanine or removing progressively the entire loop. And what you can clearly see is that this is normalized, is that if you have the full length tapasine, then you have normal MHC presentation on the surface with this MHC allele, and that removal of the loop basically reduces the MHC presentation completely on the cell surface, which means that our hypothesis becomes to be interesting. It, this loop is essential for loading of peptide. No loops, no loading of peptide. Aha, oh, that's becoming really, really interesting. And then what we do is that we do a suite of structures that, uh, what for me is structures, it doesn't matter to me if they are NMR, cryo EM, or X-ray crystallography. I am open to everything. I happen to be a little bit more of a specialist in X-ray crystallography, but I solve happily with NMR. Open your mind. Don't just follow one path. Don't get snobbish. We have too much snobbism in structural biology in Sweden where there are NMR people saying that crystallography is not interesting. I don't care because what I want to have is information that can provide me an entry to understanding how immunological questions work. So what we did, we solved these five structures, and we give us some kind of movie here. You have to the left the D-peptide, and then we try to make, we cut this peptide from 9 mer to 7 mer, and we ask, how do you bind? Or I bind mainly, you can see that this part of the peptide binds like a classical peptide, but then this one is actually trying to reach to something, but it cannot reach. And if we go further, we solve the structure of the same peptide, but then with a longer loop. And then you can see that here again, it's trying to compete away this loop from the tapasine. And then we have another even longer. So based on this succession of structures, we had a theory. And the theory is like this. For a peptide to bind to an MHC, you have to have, first you need to land here. And then the, with the N terminal, and then the C terminal, if the C terminal part of the peptide is able to have a higher affinity than this loop to the pocket there, then it can dislodge this loop, and then we'll, the whole thing will be released for presentation. That's a very short story, and we publish it in PNAS, and it's very interesting for me, for me, with, because it's just fundamental curiosity. This, uh, this is also based actually on curiosity and a lot of luck and just actually listening at the right moment to the right person. The whole thing began in 2007. I was at a place called Center for Infectious Medicine in Houdingen, and I had the chance to sit beside a fellow called Turbal van Hal from Leiden University, and then he created his own group, and then in 2007 he came by in Sweden, and he just told me, you know what, I have two peptides that are directly identical when I vaccinate mice that have a model, a cancer model with one peptide, I don't, and I don't, they all die of cancer very rapidly, but with the others they die, but they die a little bit later. Can you solve the structures of these two peptides with MHC? This if you think about it, you just go like, it's two structures of MHC, what will it give us? A plus one? Because most people do that, they don't think like that. You need to have very high impact factor studies. It has to be interesting. I decide in that case, that's luck, to say to Tobal, let's do it, okay? And then it gave rise to a whole line of research. What he showed, what Tuba showed, this is like a cancer-associated peptide. It's called EGS. It has an, it's a nightmare. And this is the one that he could sh uh, show that he could have a light survival, li a stronger survival. The only, the one main difference between these two peptides, the one that is always presented on tumor cells and the one that is the human homologue, is the presence of a proline. And since I'm a biophysician and I'm a mathematician for KTH, I knew that proline can make other kind of interactions with specific residues such as tyrosines, I will not go into the details, and I hypothesize that introduction of proline may change everything. And in the first study that we published in 2009, we just took this peptide that any vaccination with it didn't give any killing, and we substituted this serine into proline. And that goes against the dogma. Because if you put a proline in a structure, basically you rigidify, but also you change the angles. That's how structure biologists think. But 
Another thing is that sometimes you just say, let's try it. And we tried it. We took B6 mice and we injected them with these three different peptides, not simultaneously, different groups of mice with different peptides. And then we looked in vivo killing of uh, cancer cells. And then we also removed the spleen. So I will just show you one thing is that we call them then very arrogantly super peptides. This was not my idea. There was the suggestion from the former rector of Karolinska, Hans Wixel, who is a very good friend, a very inspiring person. And what you can see here is that if you vaccinate a mouse that has a very strong cancer model, there is no killing of anything. But if you take exactly the same peptide and just substitute the, the position 3 to a proline, then basically killing of cancer is just increased ridiculously. And that's what solved this. So here we have a situation. I think that when you have a discovery like this, carefulness is very, very important. Because what we demonstrate here is one thing, is that as so many other groups in the world, we can kill cancer cells in mouse models. We eradicated cancer from mice. Bravo. And the second thing is that we are using a specific MHC allele model. Can we actually make this universal? This is made with a model called H2DB, which is a mouse MHC allele. But the proof of concept is that you can actually inject peptides that are modified slightly, that look like the original one. How do we know that? Because we solve their structures. And that will con considerably change everything. Everybody with me about this? So since we already published that, we, we, if you are interested, you can look at these things. Then we went in from cancer, and another question is like, okay, so can we actually, on a curiosity-based driven <laughs> idea, go from the cancer issue towards viral infections? Many, many viruses will evolutionarily have a methodology into which some few immunodominant peptides coming from these viruses will be presented on the surface of infected cells. Okay? Which, when you begin to think about it, is not really smart. But the idea is like this. You show something that is really shiny. All the T cells begin to recognize that, and then up, you introduce a mutation, and all these T cells are worthless. And then they need to begin again from the beginning. It's called immune escape. HIV is a prototype example of immune escape virus. Smart, single mutations that do not affect the fold of the proteins from where they come, but will directly modulate the immune recognition. So if we go very simple, this is a model of a T cell receptor with a V alpha, V beta. You have to guess the loops here. You have the peptide here, and then you have the MHC. Everybody with me? And then we have this position number four that is pointing up just between the legs of the V alpha and the V beta. Perfect interaction. Then we have a model. This is an immunodominant peptide coming from a virus called LCMV, lymphocytic chorioméningitis virus. It's a very widely used model. It's called GP33, and it has a tyrosine that looks like this, with a hydroxyl at the tip. And we have a specific T cell receptor called P14. And P14 recognizes very well GP33. We said, if I write recognize, it's 100%. But when in vivo and in vitro, the infected cells are exposed to CD8 responses, they will rapidly introduce a single little mutation, go, taking away this hydroxyl, going for tyrosine to phenylalanine. Do you see how little the change is? The recognition by the T cell receptor goes from 100 to 0. Boom. I'm gone. OK? So we know that. We have established that. So can we make use of that in order to play games? So what we did is that we took both the wild-type peptide and the immunoscape peptide, and we substituted prolines in position three, the modification I position four. So we made we play with four peptides. And we can see here with circular decroism is that when you add the proline, when you substitute a proline position three, you significantly increase the stability of the complex for both peptides. This is surface plasmon resonance, also known as biocore. You can show here that soluble P14 T cell receptor bind stronger to the one that has a proline 
and still binds very well to the wild type. But the most significant result is here. When you have the immune escape, the T cell receptor that is soluble does not bind. You introduce a polar in the immune escape, and you have binding. And then you go, of course, you have to go functional. And this is like so-called a T cell receptor down regulation. And da T cell receptor down regulation is a common methodology to measure the response capacity of a T cell when it looks at a target it recognizes. When a T cell is going to act, it pulls down its T cell receptors. And then you can measure that. So if you see this, th that is going from this to control, you go down, that means that very good responses. And this is no responses with the immune escape. But if you put a pro line, you have an enhancement of responses. And we have a lot of stars and a lot of statistics about this. And then you solve the structures without the T cell receptor. And you see that besides some movements of some side chains, the conformation of the two peptides before and after introduction of the proline are basically similar, if not identical. So let's go to what is the most important, is that if you now take mice that are completely transgenic, no, these are mice that are B6 mice, and you transfer 10,000 T cells that all carry the P14 T cell receptor in there. And then after one day, you infect these mice with the virus. You wait seven days, and you remove their spleen, you kill them, and you test. How do you test? You test with tetramers. Since the binding of T cell receptor to MHC is very weak, what you do is that you make tetramers of this MHC. And here you use flow cytometry to see that you can identify population in these dead mice that are recognizing the wild type peptide. As expected, the ones that are recognizing are not recognizing the immune escape. But if you introduce the pro line, then you reestablish recognition. Do you follow me? And this is unique, not published yet. It means that you can actually reestablish the recognition of an immune escape. How do you demonstrate that? What you do is that you can, for example, make use of Influenza. You can vaccinate with viruses. In influenza, there is a molecule called neuraminidase. And if you put in a peptide in a specific part of neuraminidase and you infect cells with that, it is nearly guaranteed that the peptides will be presented on the cell surface. So what we did is that we created two influenza constructs together with colleagues in Australia, the group of Stephen Turner, and one of them is encoding for the immune escape peptide, another one is in, in, uh, encoding for the super peptide variant. And then we ask the question. We ask if we then infect them, vaccinate them with the influenza, and we, after 10 days, ask the question, do you recognize the immune escape? Then you can clearly see here, if you have tetramers of the immune escape and the super peptide, that here there is a population that is cross-reacting between the immune escape variant and the super peptide. Thus, in conclusion, what this study shows at the mouse level is that you can modify peptide and stimulate CD8 T cells to recognize in advance immune escape variants. That means that, theoretically, you could use this as a vaccination methodology that could combine, be combined with other things in order to prevent the apparition and fight cells that are infected with immune escape variants. Finally, most probably a run over time, these are the structures before. This is the wild type with the proline, without the proline. This is the immune escape with the proline, without the proline. Why do we do structure biology? Because we just want to understand mechanistically how does it work. Why is it important? Because if you understand that, then you can maybe generalize this. So what we did is that we solved the structures before and after T cell receptor landing. For three of them, because the immune escape, we could not solve it since the T cell receptor does not bind to it. What does this give us? That gives us like a movie, like for the first study, before and after. What happened before, what happens after? First of all, the first information is that when the, t the same T cell receptor binds to GPD3 or V3P, it binds basically identically. These are the six loops of the T cell receptor. We are just showing 
the MHC with the peptide and the tentacles, and they bind basically similarly. Ah, so what's the difference between them? Then what you do is that you look at the peptides in green before T cell receptor landing and in white after. In orange before and in sign after and in here before and after. So let's look at this one, which is a comparison of the white type peptide before and after the T cell receptor binds. What happens? Basically, it goes down a little bit in the cleft, and then there are three residues that consequently move, and uh, the peptide is flattened. So if we look at the same variant than this one with a pore line, if we put a pore line here, this is the only difference between these two. To our surprise, this residue is already positioned, and this residue is already positioned in the perfect localization before T cell receptor landing. That means that the energetical costs for binding and recognizing this one are much cheaper than this one. That could be a reason to why it is easier. Okay? It's like a McDonald's, a very bad uh, <laughs> association, but uh, ready to go. This is a peptide that is ready to go. Okay? Facilitating T cell receptor recognition. And with the variant of the immune escape that has a pore in it, you can see again, this phenyl take the same position and this lysine is more difficult to see it. And only this one moves a little bit. Meanwhile here, you need to have many more movements. This one shows how the three peptides look after the T cell receptor. They are basically similar in their conformations. So it's just cheaper energetically when you add a pore line. And to our surprise, there are only three residues on the MHC that are also affected. And they are all, when you introduce a pore line, they are all already perfectly positioned before the T cell receptor landing. Conclusion, the P3P modification reduces necessary adjustments in the peptide upon docking of this specific T cell receptor. And then we use another technology called isothermal titration calorimetry. And with that technology, we can see enthalpy and entropy. And these are the numbers that you want to see here, is that for the wild type, it costs in entropy. For the proline substituted, this is significantly reduced. It costs less energy. So you verify your hypothesis with function and biophysics. So what all this means? It is possible to reestablish T cell receptor recognition of a naturally occurring immune escape variant by increasing the stability of the MHC peptide complex. At the same time, you need to have absolute molecular mimicry between the peptide that you are modifying and the peptide that you are targeting. And how it possibly works is that you reduce the energetical costs. Same, same, but cheaper. I'm from Africa. I'm very proud to be Moroccan, and it's only in Africa you can see things like this, where such a container can be put onto such a small boat, and they still make it work. For me, when I saw this, first I was thinking, because I think joking is an absolute requirement for surviving, but it's amazing. It represents for me how a T cell receptor, the volatility of how a T cell receptor interacts with the MHC and the peptide beneath. Finally, I would like to thank these people for supporting our research. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>